Well, good afternoon, Bob. Hey, Bill. How are you? I'm doing great. It's good to have you here today. We've got Buddy King with us. This is episode 48. So it's Bob, Bill, and Buddy. Bob, Bill, and Buddy podcast. Sounds today. like a redneck wow. show. That's right. <laughs> Bob, Bill, and Buddy. Well, it's really good to have you here, Buddy. The last, three B's. Yeah. Last week, we interviewed your sister, who was, uh, who's been coming to Keswick forever and ever and ever. Amen. Yes. And we talked a little bit about the home that you grew up in. You grew up in a very amazing home. From your perspective now, why don't you tell us what it was like growing up in the King household? I feel like I'm on family feud. Like my sister was here before and she gave the answers and then I didn't hear any of them. Now I'm out here and now I better say the same thing she did, but I'm not going to. Uh, no, I, I will try to give it from my viewpoint. Uh, Actually, our musical background was quite diverse, I would say, using sort of a good term for nowadays. Um, we had gospel, we had the hymns of the church, we had classical, okay? We were also fond of musicals, Broadway. We loved the music from Ben-Hur. Mm. I mean, all those things combined. Now, we all started off in, in the church, of course, with the hymns and the sacred music, but... Um, we traveled a lot in those early days with my Aunt Catherine and Uncle Herman, the four of us, Mom, Dad, Diane, and I, Aunt Catherine and Uncle Herman. We held evangelical services all over Adams, York, Lancaster counties. Um, I mean, like five, six nights a week, right? And uh, so our musical development, was, a lot of that was going on then. And I remember going to a church in Biggerville with an all-black congregation. Okay, we, we, we did, we did the, uh, some services with them. They came to York, their choir, to sing on our weekly broadcast called The Hour of Evangelism. Uh, it was a live half hour program every Sunday afternoon. So we had influences from, this, from the uh, gospel, okay, Negro spiritual to say what it, we called it then, of course. Um, so there were all those influences and uh, Diane was much more disciplined when it came to instruction. Uh, Dad tried to teach both of us piano. I lasted about 20 minutes, I believe. <laughs> no, not really, it was longer than that. But he taught me a lot of fundamentals, okay? So our musical background, as much as we are now, of course, come full circle when we're totally into church, into Christian music, we've been through all kinds of different you know, genres, so to speak. Well, your, your musical journey has been very different than Diane's. Can you tell well, us a little bit? Well, I was going to say we started out the same, and then I'd say somewhere in high school, uh, they, we started going out more. Well, she was doing all these musicals and stuff in high school, um, but I ended up singing under the street light, so to speak, with the brothers up the way, you know? I mean, I was getting into rhythm and blues. Mm. And rhythm and blues took over my, my musical expression and um, the vocation, okay, for the next 10, 15 years, probably. I loved Curtis Mayfield from The Impressions. You might recognize that name, but uh, he wrote People Get Ready. And um, he, so he had a mixture of gospel and rhythm and blues. That's what appealed to me about Curtis. So. I tried to write songs like Curtis. I tried to sing like Curtis. He was my idol. I mean, I idolized the temptations and the impressions. And so that, those were things that, you know, then of course we grow and we, we go other directions and so on. But um, yeah, as opposed to being, it, it was never all gospel music. It was all kinds of things, you know, but all kinds of things influence everything. So, you know. You are an, an amazing vocalist. You are an arranger. You're a composer. In fact, I remember growing up, one of my favorite albums, and I didn't know at the time that you did so much of the music on it, was one that Dave Boyer did. Uh, and you wrote some absolutely incredible things. The music's got to stop. If I could tell you just how much I love him. Well, Dave. Welcome home, children. I mean. Well, Dave, you know, was, was the son of our pastor, Dave Boyer, Ralph Boyer, his father. It was our home church in York, York Gospel Center. So Dave, we knew Dave, we knew the whole God Boyer family. Of course, we grew up in the church with them. So when Dave did finally leave his 
a secular gig at the Atlantic City 500 Club and turned his life back over to the Lord and came home. Of course, he started to record. And by that time, I guess I had been starting to write, you know, some stuff for Diane. So those things became available as a result. She was the first vehicle for, for those songs, and then people would hear them. And I mean, uh, Doug Oldham, I remember, mm -hmm. recorded the Bathing in the Sunlight of His oh, Love. Wow. You know. uh, so there were, that's kind of, but a lot of that stuff, Diane had the, the uh, top religious broadcasters gave her the Album of the Year Award, which was one, one album that was almost all my stuff, I believe. I can't remember what it was called anymore, but anyway, uh, yeah, so that's kind of, we got exposure that way. So when yeah. you were writing those songs, where were you on your journey with the Lord? Well, you know, I, I think we're probably going to get around to my experience here at Keswick. Mm -hmm. um, it's amazing to me, though, how a line that I had written in a song called He Opened Up the Pages, mm -hmm. One of my favorites. Which was about our devotions, our family devotions, and our family, well, just the, the nurturing of, you know, the gospel in, in our lives. And our morning devotions, we never missed them. But at one point in the song, I'm talking about having strayed away and speaking to the fact that my life had become, or my Christian life had become something like a song I'd sung but never really heard, mm. you know? so. When I jump ahead now to what I learned here from Jim Freed right away was that there was so much ego in it. What was driving it at the time? I did have moments when I thought, oh, I'm a hypocrite, you know, here I am living one life and writing because I had all the language down, I knew the scripture, I knew the, I knew the message, I knew the whole thing. So I was very capable of putting that in the song. But there was a lot of ego at work because I could do it. And anytime you, give, you have a talent, one of the biggest, scariest things about it is that it can, your ego sort of, you know, starts to, it's generated, I mean, it's encouraged by that talent and you get so wrapped up in yourself and your ability to do it, sometimes it ends up being empty from the standpoint of where, it, where it's coming from. And most of that stuff I was doing, it, it was all there in my heart. But like the song said, it was a seed that had been planted. But, you know, like, and it said, bring up a child in the way he should go. Yes, that's what's come full, full circle now. But if it hadn't been for that seed, mm -hmm. I wouldn't be sitting here right now, Paul. Mm -hmm. You know, so it, it was a matter of expressing myself and knowing how to but not exactly knowing why. Mm. I remember the day we were sitting in Diane's house. Uh, they had invited us up for lunch and your mom and Jan and I were sitting there. Yes? It's emotional. Oh. Uh, sorry. And we got to the point in the discussion and Diane said, we think Buddy's ready to come to the Colony of Mercy. Wow. <laughs> and, uh, you know, would you be willing to talk to Buddy? And I remember it was like a couple weeks later, we met you in the parking lot at your church. And I think that was really the first time I'd ever really met you. I heard all about you, heard all the stories. I remember from, you coming across the parking lot. I was standing up against my car smoking yeah, a cigarette. Smoking a cigarette. And I remember <laughs> saying to myself, this will never happen. And then I got the call that you were on your way and Ron and Diane were bringing you down and you arrived to the Colony of Mercy. And I remember the first week, uh, there's a park bench down near the Colony Chapel and you were sitting there on the park bench. That was my bench, yes. And we sat down and we had a conversation. What brought you to the Colony of Mercy and what did God do during your time here? I think most people who come to the Colony of Mercy, and I've been thinking about this a lot, it's kind of strange that we are actually almost coincidence or whatever providential that we're sitting here talking about it because oftentimes I've thought, what really did the Colony of Mercy do for me? I mean, what, or what did it bring about that changed my life or brought me back, okay? And it occurs to me that when I got here, Jim Free got a handle on me so quick 
He knew what my problem was. Symptoms are mostly why people come here. The symptoms of sin, okay? But the true disposition of sin, and I just saw this quote from Oswald Chambers, the true disposition of sin doesn't necessarily have much to do with immorality or wrongdoing. It's self-realization that I am my own God. That's everybody's problem. I don't care where you are or who you are, or what you're doing, that's the problem, being our own God. And I think Jim immediately saw me as somebody who had that problem. Not that everybody doesn't, but he grabbed hold of that right away. And I remember we had some really rough times because I started writing a song and I remember I went to Robert and I said, Robert, I'm writing a song. And I, and I think at the time there was a setup over there where the choir was. And I got you to play a little bit of it. It was called Hold On To Me, Lord. Mm -hmm. And I remember you doing it just in a very rough way in a particular thing. I don't remember exactly, but when I told Jim that I had been talking to you about it, he got so upset with me because he recognized it as one of the symptoms where I was kind of showing my pride in that I had I'm writing a song, and, you know, and he knew that, that I had my priorities out of focus. I just, right, looking back on it now, that was the genius, or the spiritual genius, if you want to call it, of Jim Freed. And I remember in the parking lot that day, after you told me about the colony, I don't remember exactly what the timing was, but I remember you told me that when I got, got here, you were gonna hand me over to Jim Freed. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so like that. Mm -hmm. I came to realize, of course, he, he was the director of the place, and there were only maybe two or three guys in the colony who were, he was actually their counselor. The other ones, you know, so the other counselors had a lot of other, other guys. So, I mean, that, that sums it all up. And it's kind of funny that how that lyric singing a song that you never heard could connects with that in a way, you know? So what really happened here, we, I think it was a metaphor at the time when I talked about getting up off of my throne and letting Jesus sit down, you know? And I think that's, that's the essence of what happened. Then all those symptoms you can deal with, you know? but not, not until that happens. I mean, even nowadays, people are running around. Everybody's seeking redemption. They've given up on God. Who's left to redeem them? Themselves. So we're gonna do all these wonderful things. We're gonna tolerate this and we're gonna, you know, and it's all gonna be beautiful because of what we're able to do ourselves. Well, we all know how empty that ends up, you know, without God being the center of it. Mm. So during your time at the colony, as God was transforming your life, you did start writing music, and that turned into a, an album that yes. you put together. Um, yes. Would you be willing to sing one of those pieces for us? At the, at the hymn sing today, you did the song Pleasing. Pleasing, yes. Why, why don't you do that for our guests? You guys are something, aren't they? <laughs> We're sneaky. <laughs> We're sneaky. Ah, you got me. <laughs> All right. I... My quiet times with you, Lord, give me the strength to face each day. When I speak with you in the morning, you always know what my heart yearns to say. I trust you so completely, I know that nothing goes unheard. By the peace that I find as my day goes by, I know you've listened to every word. And I'm living within your grace, 
sustained by your tender mercy, boldly coming in faith, yet humbly into your presence. Lord, this is how I pray, though sinful and so unworthy, please help me to be pleasing to you. In all that I say and do My quiet times with you, Lord Help me to make it through the night when I call to you in the evening, you come and cover me with your mighty power in our conversation. And I can rest upon your word. And from the peace that I find as I close my eyes, I know my every prayer has been and I'm living within your grace Sustained by your tender mercy Boldly coming in faith Yet humbly into your presence Lord, this is how I pray Though sinful and so unworthy, please help me to be pleasing to you in all that I say and do. For as much as you are worthy of my worship, for as much as you are worthy of my praise, you are even more conditioned of my constant companion to acknowledge you in all of my ways. Lord, this is how I pray, though sinful and so unworthy. Please help me to be pleasing to you in all that I say and do. Lord, help me to be and I want to make sure everybody knows what they are. You're fine. I messed up. <laughs> I, well, um, that bridge has a certain amount of um, something special about it, too. As much as you are worthy of my worship, nowadays there's such an emphasis on worship. For as much as you are worthy of my praise, that's true, too. But you're more deserving of my constant commitment to acknowledge you in all of my ways. There's such an emphasis now on days, of course, we worship, 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 but, you know, it certainly goes more f further than that. As much as he is worthy of our worship, I'm sorry I sort of made up some things there at the end of the bridge. <laughs> well, we've you guys all, we've all me done that. <clears throat> yeah. Okay, so you gotta let's, keep going. let's talk about worship and praise because I would like to know from your perspective, Robert asked Diane this last week, from your perspective, what, what is missing in the worship that we have going on today? Lots of good stuff, but there seems to be some emptiness there. Hmm. Boy, um, what's missing? I think once again, 
I'm a big C.S. Lewis fan. And he's spoken so much about this, about the, the ritual and the, 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 the importance of taking your mind off of yourself and focusing on God, focusing on the Lord. Foc- uh, um, so I think that's what's missing to me. There, there's, there's an awful lot of this and this and everybody, but I don't feel as if there's a, a real, there's something missing in it to me. Um, and I think it has to do with that good old disposition of sin. You know, I still so keep going back there because I keep thinking that that's, you know, now as far as from a technical standpoint, as far as the music is concerned, for the most part, I think it's very mediocre music, mm. okay? I know there's some good things out there, I've heard them, okay? I mean, there's some good writers. But in general, it seems geared towards simplicity something that everybody can get into and sing along with, and particularly something everybody can play, (laughs) because you learn yourself four or five chords. Now, people are going to say to me, oh, buddy, you know, you really shouldn't be that judgmental about this. You know, the Lord sees their heart, and so on and so forth. So, you know, everybody be careful where you're going with this. But I can't help it. That's just where I'm coming from now with all of it. I don't want to sound to be so exclusive or something about it, but... We, I think, our generation is much more willing to see it, the younger generations, you know, what they do and to appreciate that and to, you know, to believe it and to take them sincerely than they are in reverse. I think, you know, they want to throw out. And I'm not talking about the younger generation. We were just talking about it yesterday. Younger people nowadays are looking for something they're not getting from (laughs) this music. They don't get the substance that we had out of the good hymns, out of the hymnals, and, and well, so on. It's interesting. When you played the song for us, it is not three or four chords. It is a complex, and, and especially on the bridge, how you wove down through there, you were changing a key and, and transposing and coming back to the original. You're being more creative, and, and I think that so many of the songs that have three or four chords, we're, we get bored with them. Oh my goodness, yes. I think it's easy to get bored with them. And I, I think it's because they're boring. I mean, in my, in my church, when I go to their morning service now, they're doing it in the Family Life Center. Now I know we're in the activity center here. This isn't called, a, we're not trying to make this a sanctuary. I mean, we have a sanctuary over at Rawls Auditorium. Our church has a sanctuary. They don't use the name. It's now called a worship center. Okay, so there's something, you know, uh, what were you saying? The question was... Well, the use of creative chords and, oh, and yes. not just being stuck in a three or four rut. I was thinking about Dad. You know, Dad was never one to be an improvisational player. He was very structured, you know, because he's a classical musician and, and, and so on, you know. And I'll never forget... Um, Uncle Trevor was down in York visiting from Western Canada, and Dad was in fiddling around on the piano. And he really wasn't, he, he was more or less improvising, but he was by himself, you know. And, and my mom said to my Uncle Trevor, what's Brian playing? And Uncle Trevor said, nothing. <laughs> we always thought that was hilarious. But no, um, that's, yes, I, I love the structure, I hope that that kind of thing is accompanied by a heartfelt, soulful, you know, content to the whole thing, too. So, yeah, I like leaving keys and coming back and, and you know, creating atmospheres and so on, which is impossible with this stuff now. It's just not there, Robert. It's, it's you know, it's just pretty, to me, superficial, you know. Now, I know it means stuff to people, and, and it means, and I don't want to judge, God judges the heart, God sees sees it all. But personally, you're asking my opinion, I, I long, I just long for hymnals again. Yeah. So <laughs> can I ask one question? Um, can jazz music or gospel music or the rhythm and blues music, can those chords and that style of music be incorporated into what you're talking about and be used for God's glory? Absolutely. Because Absolutely. those chords are a little more interesting. Absolutely. 
Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, it, it's almost like a difference between what we used to call doo-wop. Doo-wop was that. It's almost every song on the radio back in the early 50s was that way, you know. Mm -hmm. Well, honest to goodness, one of the reasons Curtis Mayfield just blew me away is because that wasn't Curtis Mayfield. <laughs> he was doing stuff that, you know, nobody else was writing. I mean, and, and it came out of the gospel. There's a combination of the gospel and the rhythm and blues and so on. And that's why, boy, all of a sudden, because I never cared for the doo-wop. I, I didn't like all that. I don't know. I can't even explain it, explain it but it just didn't appeal to me. And I, I was looking for something, you know, new and fresh. And along came Curtis. And, man, I heard him and I, I loved it. So, yes, I think, I think there's so much room for all kinds of things when it comes to claiming or exclaiming the gospel, you know. I mean, the Lord uses everything, but I, I just wish there were more. But, and some of those chords would help us to emote what we believe in our heart. Yes. Be because they're more creative. Yes, more creative, and I think create a, he a more of an atmosphere um, and... and uh, how should I say? Well, an atmosphere for worship and, and for adoration mm -hmm. and for taking your concentration off of yourself and focusing completely on God and not, you know, I mean, there's so many reasons that we could see, to me, improvement in today's mm -hmm. church music, so to speak. You know, it's very hard to go in anywhere and sing a hymn anymore. Right. I think one of the things that's frustrating to me and what Robert and Joyce do well is that when they lead worship, everybody participates. Yes. Uh, he's taken old hymns, putting a new setting with them, but when you look around the room, everybody's singing. Uh, when we go to so many churches, we, we find that people are standing there. They're not engaged with the worship. They're not really, it's like they're zombies. They're observers. The, the, the worship team are having a wonderful time worshiping <laughs> and praising the Lord, but everybody else is just standing there. And I don't think that that's, I mean, I think there's times when the worship team can worship by themselves, but I think when we get together corporately, it ought to be us all singing together. And what amazes me, even at our own church, is when they'll throw in a hymn like, It Is Well With My Soul the volume goes from nobody singing to everybody singing yeah. <laughs> because they're engaged in that. Right, right. And, and if I, we could only get to the place of saying we need to have a blended worship, we need to not forget the old hymns because the old hymns have the richness. Uh, get me on my soapbox. Well, it's a generation, you know, that raised us, actually. I mean, or, or, or we're raising the new generations, and it's, it's, it's the adults more than the young people now right. who I think are so afraid that they're going to be irrelevant. Right. You know, it's all this matter of being relevant. We want to communicate. I mean, I can see here with the colony, with all the different guys, different ages and everything else coming in, it's quite a challenge, you know, because you want everybody involved, but you've got to say, well, my goodness, there's all kinds of different backgrounds here and so on, you know? So you want the music to really mean something to them. So in order to accomplish that, you got to walk a lot of different kind of, you know, uh, tight ropes with, with your different, uh, the way you present it, the way you sing it, the way you play it, the way you, you know, sort of promote but it. Was, it's always interesting to me at the Colony when the men have an opportunity to pick a song, they pick it based on what it says. They may not even know how the melody goes. They pick it based on the message the lyric, of the song. Yeah. On the lyric, yeah. It was always a big question with me about what comes first, you know, the music or the lyric. Mm -hmm. you know? um, some, of the, some of the best team songwriters, they say Backrack and David or something like that. I could just see how David come up to Bert Backrack and going, uh, I got this idea for a song called The Look of Love. And I, I thought it might go like, The Look of Love is on your face. And Backrack said, yeah, I like that. You know, well, he has a whole lyric. Well, he presented both lyric and music at the same time to Backrack, and Backrack just took it and, you know, did miracles with it. But, yeah, the lyric, I think, has always been the part that you express first. It's, it's, it's what you express about your emotions before the music even hits, most of the time. That's not always true. 
I mean, sometimes it's a combination. My favorite songwriter now is Jimmy Webb. He marries a lyric and a, and a melody better than anybody I've ever known. Mm -hmm. I mean, Diana and I have been to see him a couple times in concert. You know, he's MacArthur Park by the time I get to Phoenix, Wichita, and I'm mm -hmm. up, up in the way. Um, yeah, so that marriage of lyric, but I, I agree. I think the lyric is, first and foremost, what you need to look for. And a good lyric inspires great music. Mm -hmm. you know. Well, let's close out this time. It's been really fun having you here and uh, having an opportunity to dialogue. But, so let's do Amazing Grace. Sure, let's do that. I don't that. think we've ever done anything. But I don't think we have us. either. And uh, I hope I can remember all the words. <laughs> yeah. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found, was blind. But now I see T'was grace that taught my heart to fear And grace my fears relieved How precious dear that grace appear the hour I first believed through many dangers toils and snares I have already That brought me safe thus far, and grace will lead me home. When we've been there ten thousand years, bright shining. To sing God's praise Than when we first begun We've no less days To sing God's praise Than when we first begun. Wow, that was fun. <laughs> well, Bob, I can't believe it. it's the end of uh, the month. Yeah. And we're getting ready to go into a brand new month. So I want to encourage you, check out the list of podcasts that we do. Uh, every Monday through Friday at 1.30, Robert and Joyce do Worship Live. It's available on Facebook, BoxCast, and YouTube. And then every day at 2.30, there's a podcast airing. So check out the schedule on our website, www.americaskeswick.org. And just a reminder that America's Keswick does depend on friends like you to support the ministry with your gifts and with your prayers. To make a gift, call 1-800-453-7942. Or visit our website, www.americaskeswick.org. Hit that little button that says Donate Now. God bless you, and we look forward to seeing you this time next week.